The Emeritus Professor of Plant Pathology at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, he's an active scientific reviewer, consultant to academia, industry and government, and an international research cooperator with projects in 11 countries as well as in the United States. His research over the past years has focused on improving the efficiency of fertilizers and the control of soil-borne plant pathogens. As a retired colonel, his 41-year military career don evaluated natural and man-made biological threats, including germ warfare and disease outbreaks. Uh, he is the author or co-author of over 300 journal articles, three books, and 84 special invited publications. Dr. Huber will speak on the connection between crop health and good plant nutrition, with a special focus on rising problems linked to intensive use of Roundup and GM crops. Thank you very much. Well, it's an honor to be here. I uh, appreciate the hospitality and the invitation and the opportunity to share a little bit of my research, research of a lot of other scientists that are very concerned about the issues that are involved. When we talk about genetic engineering, we have to also talk about or recognize the interaction that we have with the chemicals that they're either designed to tolerate or that they're engineered to produce. Because 99% of all of the commercial genetically engineered plants are all engineered either for herbicide tolerance or for uh, to produce an insecticide. That means that the these chemicals are going to be in the food that we eat and in the plants that we feed to our animals. So in understanding what those materials are, or what they do, uh, like get into the Roundup Ready, or Roundup itself, it was first, key, or first patented as a very strong mineral chelator by Stauffer Chemical Company. It was in 1964. It was used to clean boilers and uh, steam pipes. It was then patented 10 years later as a very powerful herbicide by Monsanto Company, but its herbicidal activity is also based on its ability to chelate minerals. In other words, when we chelate a mineral, that chemical can grab onto one of the minerals. It's essential for our critical plant function and essentially uh, immobilize it so that that function in the plant can't be performed. In 2010, Monsanto also patented it as a very broad spectrum, powerful antibiotic. Again, that activity is based on its ability as a very powerful mineral chelator in our, in its ability to immobilize minerals in the biological system or in the environment so that physiological functions that are dependent on those minerals can't take place. It's an organic phosphate type of chemical. It's a phosphite, so it's very difficult to degrade, very persistent. It can be detoxified through its chelating with calcium, magnesium, or iron, or other minerals in the soil. It's not necessarily degraded. Monsanto's lost two major lawsuits where they sued Monsanto for fraudulent advertising for claiming biodegradability, safety, and environmental benefit. They lost both of those because it's a very difficult chemical to degrade. It does take place, it may take a year and a half, or it may take 22 years. Depends on the soil and depends on the organism. Again, we need to recognize that this is a chem chemical uh, Sam Sellen, Santa Fe, Massachusetts Institute of Technology stated that's probably the most toxic, chronically toxic chemical that's ever been introduced into the environment. Not very acutely toxic, but chronically toxic because it's an antibiotic, a broad spectrum uh, chelator, and has all of those interactions as a persistent chemical 
to accumulate biologically in various systems. Many of our farmers are saying the crops don't look quite as vigorous anymore. They blame it on the seed, and part of that may be the, de the degraded seed quality that we see in the genetic engineering. You have to have all of those minerals as the seed treatment because many of them aren't in the seed anymore like they used to be. And you can see that effect. What we're seeing essentially is reduced mineral availability that, that affects the vigor and the nutritional density of those crops. Now, it's been a very powerful herbicide because it's systemic. You can point it at the plant, get some of it on, and it's translocated throughout the plant. It accumulates, though, in the growth points. So that in the root tip, shoot tips, leg legume nodules, and the reproductive structures is where you'll have a high concentration of that 80% of the glyphosate that stays in the plant for the life of the plant. Then you have about 20% of the glyphosate that moves down in the root system and out into the soil. As it moves out into the soil, it's a very powerful antibiotic to those microorganisms that are responsible for soil health, for soil aggregation, water permeability, for our natural biological controls for many of our soil-borne pathogens, pseudomonas, bacillus, our mycorrhizal fungi, Many other of those organisms are all very sensitive to this powerful antibiotic as it moves out into the soil. The pathogens, however, are insensitive to glyphosate. They have an alternative physiological pathway. So that Fusarium, Rhizoctonia, Pythium, Guanamyces, Phytophthora, are all those organisms that are stimulated by glyphosate and they're the actual herbicidal mode of action. It reduces nutrient uptake because it's also toxic to those organisms that reduce iron and manganese to an available form for plant uptake. Again, it impacts all of this ecology that we're managing when we're farming. You can't kill a plant with glyphosate in sterile soil. You stun it, and you give that plant a bad case of AIDS. You compromise when you shut down the shikimate pathway. You shut down the plant's defenses to stress, to pathogens, and to all of the biological uh, interactions that would take away from its yield quality performance. In sterile soil, it only stunts it. When you have those soil-borne pathogens there that we always have to deal with, they're the ones that are actually the herbicidal mode of action. So we create super pathogens. When we have a resistant weed, it's not resistant to the glyphosate, it's resistant to the soil-borne pathogens, Fusarium and Rhizoctone and those other organisms. So that in Again, we have super weeds that then become more difficult to control with our other management techniques like we've done for years. We see new, in, new diseases or more severe diseases. You can see up in the top is Cornospora root rot on Roundup Ready soybeans. This was, wasn't considered a disease before 1996. Same thing with sudden death syndrome. But you can see the effect of putting a little glyphosate on these Roundup Ready soybeans and having it move down into the root system where it stimulates this soil-borne fungus. And I've seen yield losses as much as 40% of the crop. You see the same thing with take all. This whole field, this was at the agronomy farm, that entire field was uh, Roundup Ready soybeans the previous year had a few weeds over here late in the season and the station superintendents 
sent the crew out and said, spray this half of the field over here, put a flag down. Don't need to spray the other side. It's planted to wheat then. And this side, if you shell out the ears on this side, all you end up with is shriveled grain and a bunch of chaff. Mm -hmm. Over here, you see the, the fungus is always in the soil. You see the root nibbling, but if you shell out the ears, you're going to see plump kernels, even on these early maturing varieties that our breeders have developed. Still has plump kernels, and you'll see a good healthy root system compared to those black roots over here typical of takeoff. Sudden death syndrome, you see the same thing. This part of the field had been an alfalfa, received two quarts of glyphosate to burn out the alfalfa previous fall. This was in sweet corn, which didn't have any glyphosate on it. The farmer then planted it all to round up ready soybeans. And another week later than this, all of this is, would, was defoliated from sudden death syndrome, which you see up here, because glyphosate is a very powerful antibiotic that changes the biology of the soil. Sudden death syndrome is caused by Fusarium glycine common soil-borne fungus. I isolated it in 1957 repeatedly in studies I was doing on microbial ecology in Michigan. The fungus didn't originate in 1996, but the disease did. So that we change the environment, we change the conditions then that make those plants more susceptible to many of these diseases. This is Goss's wild on corn, systemic bacterial disease. You can see the genetically engineered compared to the non-engineered susceptibility to this disease. This disease costs us one billion bushel in 2011. Same thing in 2012. And it continues to reduce our yields because the corn dries off two to three weeks now before physiological maturity. Many of our growers are saying, well, isn't that normal? That's not normal. Two to three applications of fungicide on corn isn't normal. But that's what we're doing. There isn't anything in the genetic engineering technology that does anything to the glyphosate that's applied to the plant. All it does is provide an alternative system so you can provide, you can apply the chemical without killing the plant. The glyphosate is a systemic chemical still in the plant, still a powerful mineral chelator, and reduces the efficiency of that plant physiologically for a number of functions. If you wanted a real definition of genetic engineering as it's practiced today, the only analogy that I know of that will fit is it's a, like a virus infection has very little similarity at all to a breeding program. We transfer genes in with viruses and bacteria, and that's essentially what we're doing in genetic engineering. We're using the CAN 35 promoter, virus promoters, to transfer the genes in. Goes in randomly, but it has very low relationship to a plant breeding program. It disrupts the integrity of the genetic code. That's why we always see a yield drag when we compare isogenic parents with the genetically engineered progeny. So that there are many changes that take place with the genetic engineering because our science and understanding of genetics today is different than the whole basis of genetic engineering which is based on one gene, one function. It's flawed science, and therefore more like a uh, flawed theology as it's practiced currently. You see those changes in, in the genetically engineered plants. This is uh, Roundup Ready soybeans. You'd anticipate a reduction in lignin because that's a product produced through the shikimate pathway that is impacted by glyphosate. But then we're growing those plants as a nutrient source for our animals or for us. And you see the reduced amino acid content. 
You see the reduced photosynthesis up at the top. And another very significant change that takes place is you have a reduced water use efficiency. Takes twice as much water to produce a kilogram of dry matter in a Roundup Ready plant that's treated with glyphosate than it does in its non-glyphosate treated pair. What do we have with our inconsistencies in moisture? With rainfall, with global climate change, and all of these things. You're going to see all of these spikes and, and valleys as far as water availability. As a strong chelator, it changes the water use efficiency. You also have a smaller root system in the genetically engineered plant. Soybeans, you lose those roots that would normally do the deeper water uh, draw for you, but also affecting the uh, nutrient uptake in that plant. You say, does it really make a difference? Can the plant compensate for us? This is 2012. We had a long period in between rains, and you can see the Roundup Ready, and you can see the normal, same soil, same weather, but a tremendous difference in stress and drought uh, effect on those plants. Same thing for corn. These two corn fields are separated by a 60-foot gravel road. Yes, both of them are suffering from water, but you can see which one has really impacted the most. And you had an 80 bushel difference in yield between those two fields that were separated only by that gravel uh, road. So there are two factors that you really need to be aware of. One is the disruption of the integrity of the genetic code by the genetic engineering process that reduces nutrient uptake efficiency. Here's 17% less manganese, 47% less zinc. And then you put the glyphosate on and you further impact that nutrient availability for that plant so that that plant can't work as efficiently for you as it was designed to do. Can't capture the sun's energy and store the sugar like we're growing it for. And then we see the uh, resistant weeds, which essentially are nullifying any benefit that we had. Not only the resistant weeds, but the resistant insects. So the recommendation of the companies now is, is to use all of your old pesticides, both insecticides and herbicides, because of, in order to avoid crop failure. We see a growing concern on food and feed safety. Items that have never been adequately studied because when Monsanto went to the EPA and FDA, they said it only inhibits the EPSPS enzyme of the shikimate pathway. We know that it in now inhibits 291 enzymes. It's a broad spectrum antibiotic on top of that. So it has many effects that are of serious concern from a health and safety standpoint. We know that our foods are less nutrient dense. This is just looking at Roundup Ready alfalfa and Roundup Ready soybeans and the reduction in nutrient density. That's going to impact the health of your animals. It's going to impact our health because that's where we get those minerals and how we maintain our overall uh, healthy status. Animals can tell the difference between a GMO and a non-GMO. This is a triple stack. This is its isogenic normal parent. These two bags are left at the back of the warehouse. Gilbert Hostetler said, wonder if the mice are telling me something that I ought to know. <laughs> These two ears, again, triple stack, genetically engineered, and its normal parent. Stayed up in the tree for nine months. You can see over winter, the squirrels got a little hungry, nibbled on those, but they didn't like the stomach ache that comes with a genetically engineered food. Wow. 
had a farmer grow sweet corn in Florida, the first year that he could grow it. Commented he thought it was the greatest thing he'd ever found. I asked him why he thought it was so great, and he said it's all the years that he's grown sweet corn, it's the first year the raccoons wouldn't eat a single ear. <laughs> He sends it up north to us Yankees all during the winter. 2002, United Stock Growers gave testimony before our Senate Ag Committee, Congress, said there are two conditions that are threatening survival of the industry. One of them is premature aging. You take a prime beef to market, and it's graded down as though it's a 12-year-old cow coming out of a dairy. The other one was reproductive failure, both infertility and lost pregnancies. As they state, 40 to 50 percent lost pregnancies, pretty difficult to stay in business if you've got a dairy. Pretty hard to stay in business if you've got pigs or if you've got sheep or if you've got any other animals just from a replacement standpoint. So that these two conditions for a threat to our industry, they're becoming more severe of a dairy north of us, where we live now in Idaho, and had 70% lost pregnancies last year. They're considering bankruptcy. Can't get the replacement animals. And then this is a study that was published in 2011, a survey of the veterinarians from Mexico all the way up to Canada. Their question was, why are so many cows losing pregnancy? Just some of the data here, you can see how many are that were pregnant, that have lost their pregnancy, are now open. And you look at how many services are required to even uh, have that cow settle. That's lost time, that's lost resources, lost production efficiency. Fertility in the United States dropped 30% in the last five years in human. That's on top of another 25% the previous five years. One of the doctors at our medical school said it's not unusual for a woman to have four or five miscarriages before she can have a live birth. That's not normal. And then you see all of the other interactions with the antibiotic effects on our beneficial microorganisms. These are those beneficial organisms in the environment and in our GI tracts. This is in chickens. You'll see the same thing with, with cattle and, and uh, bees and frogs. These are the organisms that protect us from the pathogens that are stimulated and their virulence increased when you have the genetically engineered feed that's being fed to them. Research Dr. Monica Kruger shows that that healthy microbiome, those organisms, this is uh, Enterococcus uh, here, will completely suppress Clostridium botulinum and suppress the bot neurotoxin that can kill animals very readily if it's preformed. But if you have a tenth of a part per million glyphosate in the feed, it's toxic to these organisms. We don't have any voids in nature, so that Clostridium then fills that void, produces that lethal bot neurotoxin, and in short time, the animal finally dies from chronic botulism. This is the same disease that causes sudden infant death syndrome because in a baby it takes about a year to develop that protective microbiome in the GI tract. You see the effect on bees and other environmental animals, so that with bee colony collapse. When you take the bacillus and by lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, the bees can't digest the honey and the bee protein. They also lose their immunity then to a whole series of different pathogens. And you see that loss then, if you look at a bee that's collecting pollen in a non-GMO crop, it'll be liquid, it's being digested, it's being utilized. When they forage on the GMO crops, without those organisms, it's just like having a bunch of granules or gravel in the honey crop in the stomach 
because they can't digest it and they soon succumb. There's a direct toxicity of glyphosate that's been well recognized scientifically for a number of years. You can look at those levels, very low. In fact, our initial to uh, tolerance level for glyphosate was a tenth of a part per million. These are the new levels that we have. Remember that a tenth of a part per million and sometimes a tenth of a part per billion can be have the antibiotic effect and look at what our levels are now. The consequence of that is that we have chronic diseases that are reaching pandemic proportions. This is celiac in young children severe enough to require hospitalization in Alberta, Canada. This is the curve for adoption of GMO canola and the increased levels of glyphosate that go along with the GMO crops. If you look at that curve, you'll find that it fits 32 different diseases, everything from autism to diabetes to leaky gut, Crohn's to celiac to difficile diarrhea, and all of those other diseases that only correlate epidemiologically and they're correlating at 0.95 to 0.99 percent on that with those 32 diseases. Law County, anencephaly, you'll also see spinal bifida, uh, cleft palate, other deformities. But what we're seeing here with anencephaly, the brain only develops about halfway. Babies are usually born, stillborn, they live, they live for 24 to 48 hours. In 2008, they had some invasive weeds that came in in the three rivers that serve as a drinking water and the irrigation water for the entire county. They started dumping in the rodeo, the glyphosate, in those rivers for invasive weed control, and then a year later, you see that spike then in this uh, very serious tragedy, not just in anencephaly, as I've plotted here, but you'll see it also, again, with those other deformities that come when you disrupt the endocrine hormone system in those early stages of development for the child. So you can look at all of those diseases that I mentioned, and you take that, you can plot the increased severity of the disease is an exact match essentially with the uh, increase in severity of all of these diseases. For about half of these, the best treatment that we have, and sometimes a life-saving treatment if it's difficile diarrhea and clostridium, is a fecal transplant to restore that gut microbiome that's been destroyed by the antibiotic effect of the glyphosate. I work in Guatemala. Right next to us, one in four sugarcane workers is dying right now from end-stage kidney failure because of the glyphosate used as a ripening agent in the sugarcane. Not just in El Salvador, it's in Panama, Sri Lanka is seeing the same thing in many other areas. We have an epidemic of autism in the U.S. So that in 1970, we had one child in 10,000, or 100, one child in 10,000 that was autistic. In 2007, we had one in 150. In 2009, we had one in 100. In 2013, one in 50. And in 10 years, the prediction is that one in two will be born autistic. And then you add that to all of those other diseases that we're experiencing in that previous table. And we're a, a tragedy that's already here that we haven't recognized. You look at the overall system then, you can see that same curve essentially for autism. And you look at the overall relationship. So if we 
summarize the system that we're finding today. I think future historians may well look back upon our time and write not about how many pounds of pesticide we did or didn't apply, but about how many, about how willing we are to sacrifice our children and jeopardize future generations with this massive experiment that's based on false promises and flawed science just to benefit the bottom line of a commercial enterprise. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and there's time for a few questions. Uh, but